It seems now more than ever that science stories are making the news. And it also seems like more than ever, people are making up their own conclusions about what these science studies are actually telling us. I happen to think based on what I've read, I've read a lot about hydroxy. Now, I'm not surprised because some of these studies are actually pretty complicated to understand. Let's take this example right here. So this is a published article, and, and it's published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is a very prestigious medical journal. I'm sure you're familiar with this story about hydroxychloroquine, this miracle drug that perhaps didn't turn out to be such a miracle. Well, I'm going to walk you through the data that came up with that conclusion. Take a look here. So just to explain how this experiment was actually done, what they did is they, they found people who were in close proximity to uh, other individuals who they know tested positive for COVID. So obviously those people were at a pretty high risk of developing COVID themselves. And what they did is they separated them into two groups. One group was given a, a placebo and the other one was given this hydroxychloroquine. There was about 500 people in each group. So this is a pretty big study. Now they tested these individuals at different days following that initial treatment. And you can see that over time, more and more people got positive. Now, I think the most telling number is right here. At day 14, you can actually see a difference between the placebo and the hydroxychloroquine. The numbers work out like this. 11.8% of the individuals tested positive when they were given the drug, and 143 were positive when they were not. So what that's saying is that by receiving hydroxychloroquine, there was a reduction in the rate of infection. That's a good thing. It means that the drug was working. Now the bigger question is whether that 2.5% drop was significant. So here you can calculate confidence intervals and it was actually determined with a few statistical tests that from the confidence interval, they could not reliably say that this drug was actually improving the outcome of patients. In other words, there was no proof that this drug was helpful. Therefore, the conclusion was, and these are the words from the authors, that receiving this drug did not actually lower the rate of infection. Now remember the point of these drug trials. We're not gonna give people drugs on the off chance that it might be helpful. We do need to prove that the drug is helpful because it may do more harm than good. Now there are countless other examples like this, the idea of comparing between two means. So that's really what we're gonna talk about in this video here. And we're, I'm gonna show you one test that can be done called a t-test to compare means. All right, let's have a bit of a contest. Me against you, we're gonna pick a game and see who can do better. Now let's pick every chemist's favorite carnival game, whack-a-mole. So let's say this data represents, I don't know, how many points we can score in a minute of playing this game. So we've actually done this experiment a couple times, we've repeated the game, and we've come up with an average and a standard deviation. It looks like I played the game five times, you played it six, you see I got a bum shoulder, so I got a little bit tired. And this is the data that we got. And the first impression says that you beat me. But just a second, this is just a, a small sampling of all of the data. And if you think about it, so there's no guarantee that these results are even different from one another. In fact, some of the times I actually went higher than what you did. So let's look at the data as a whole and see if this can represent where one person is better than the other or if it's just simply a tie. Now that's one key point that you should keep in mind. A t-test always assumes that the numbers start off as being the same. In other words, they're part of the same distribution. One is no better, no worse than the other. So we're, we're taking what we call a null hypothesis, which assumes that both data sets are the same. And we're gonna use these, these equations here to calculate uh, with the statistical confidence whether the values are different or not. In other words, whether they're part of the same group. We need to calculate three different numbers here. This one's simple. We have a pool value and then this T. Now the T value is actually going to be compared to a table, just like our T tables that we used before um, to determine if our value is statistically significant or not. So once we calculate T, we're gonna compare that to the, the critical value, which we get from the table. And if the value that we calculate is larger than the critical value, as we see here, then we can reject the null hypothesis. So to go through these calculations using the data from our, our little whack-a-mole game, uh, let's, let's do the calculations. The degrees of freedom is probably the easiest one to figure out. It's just based on the number of replicates that I've done, the number of replicates that you've done, so that's a quick calculation. The pool value, well, it just uses the standard deviation from one set, the standard deviation from another set, and then how many replicates are in there. So all of the, va the values are presented in here as well. We have the standard deviation just from this data set, 
a standard deviation from this one, and the numbers can plug in here. So it's kind of a place to easily make mistakes on a calculator. Use Excel for these kinds of things. It's a lot simpler to do, and we get a, an S pool value of 5.58. And then finally, the T experimental is done by comparing the difference between the means. It's always a positive number because it's an absolute value, so it doesn't matter if you take this one or that one, um, divided by the S pool and then the numbers in here. So we plug all these values in and we come up with an expected T value of 1.18. That value is put into a table and we compare based on nine degrees of freedom. Our expected value of T is 1.18. We normally use 95% confidence, but in this case, it actually doesn't even matter which number we use. No matter what, this value is always smaller than all of these values in the range. So, I mean, I could have picked 95%, but the point is that T expected is always lower than T critical. So what does that mean? It means we have to accept the null hypothesis. Remember that this null hypothesis, the assumption that the data is the same, that all the data comes from the same group. So since we've accepted that, we're kind of concluding that even though your scores looked a little higher than mine, it's actually not enough to say that there's a difference. So sorry to say it, but it looks like from the data that we have a statistical tie. So just a couple things to wrap this video up. First of all, statistics does not actually prove that things are different. What it's doing is it's proving that things are not the same, that they're not part of the same data set. And that is based on a limited sampling of each of the populations. Secondly, when you're doing these calculations, it won't always report a, a, a certain confidence level. But as I've been saying before, if you don't have a number, let's just pick 95% and go with that value. And lastly, it will never be mentioned to you like in a, in a problem, but you have to always think about outliers. So take a look at your data. If you notice that one of your data points looks like it might be an outlier, go ahead and do one of those grubs tests to decide if you can reject the data before actually proceeding to do your comparison of means.